Bishop David Bard of uh, the Michigan Annual Conference and uh, for a season the Minnesota Annual Conference uh, has juggled all of the balls with exceeding great skill and uh, he's well prepared for this office and for this role that he's going to play today. Would you receive uh, Bishop David Bard as he comes? Well, as Bishop Palmer noted, I've been serving both Michigan and Minnesota. And in Minnesota, we are right on schedule. <laughs> It'll help if you keep up. It'll just go a little bit faster that way. <laughs> so this is it. The Episcopal Address. You know, what, what you just, when you're elected a delegate, you say, I can hardly wait for the Episcopal Address. You don't know who's going to give it, but you know, you can hardly wait, and here it is. It is the only thing standing between you and the results of the last ballot. It is the only thing standing between you and your lunch. This is like, rain on your wedding day, <laughs> the free ride when you've already paid, the good advice you just didn't take. <laughs> so I do want to read some scripture. <laughs> From Luke 14, beginning with the verse 7, and then I'm going to read a few verses from Romans chapters 12, 13, and 14. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited to a, by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host, and the host who invited you both may come and say to you, give this person your place then in disgrace you would start to the lowest place. But when you're invited, go and sit down at the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher, then you'll be honored in the presence of all who sit at tables with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. He also said to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, well, start on time, but uh, no. When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return, and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Romans 12. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor, do not lag in zeal, be ardent in hope, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. Skipping to chapter 13, owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves has another has fulfilled the law, the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. From chapter 14, welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. 
Some believe in eating anything while the weak eat only vegetables. The, I, I have something to say about that later. Those who, eat, those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make, a, make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day observe it in honor of the Lord. Those who eat, eat in the honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain in the honor of the Lord, and they give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. Ground control to Major Tom. Ground control to Major Tom. Take your protein pills and put your helmet on. Ground control to Major Tom. Commencing countdown engines on. Check ignition and may God's love be with you. May God's love be with you. Indeed, I greet you in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the peace and power of the Holy Spirit. It is my honor to share this year's Episcopal address, even if the timing is not what I would have wanted it to be. I'm deeply grateful to all of my colleagues on the college for their prayers, their support, their companionship in ministry together, for their diligence and their hard work. Much has been asked of us, and I want to particularly note how much has been asked of our retired bishops. Bishop John Hopkins has provided Episcopal leadership for the Northern Illinois Conference. Bishop Deb Kesey for the Iowa and Dakotas Conferences. <laughs> Bishop Sally Dick retired and became the ecumenical officer for the Council of Bishops and now has been serving as bishop for the California-Nevada Conference. <laughs> and Bishop Brousseau retired to become the executive secretary of the Council of Bishops. So back to that song. Can anybody name it? Space Oddity. Thank you. I was, I, I'm glad I sang it in a recognizable form. Thanks, Andy. <laughs> space Oddity. We find ourselves in an odd space. And frankly, the Episcopal address is a bit of an odd space. Is it a sermon? There's no offering. Is it a lecture? Is it a formal speech? Yes. And this Episcopal dress finds itself in the unenviable position of having had powerful sermons preached by Bishop O and Bishop Malone. Yeah. And we anticipate powerful sermons from Bishop Trimble and Bishop Dick. And smack dab in the middle is the Episcopal address. And I'm really hoping to give you more than pimento loaf. <laughs> I thought that might quiet your appetites for a little bit longer, just the mention of pimento loaf. And, and we find ourselves in an odd space. This is not 2020. It's 2022. And I know you share my gratitude for the host committee and conference staff from Indiana who have had to work so much longer than they had ever anticipated. <laughs> And all of you, you've been delegates. You're like setting the world record for delegates to jurisdictional conferences. Thank you for that work. And we find ourselves in an odd space historically and politically. We're less than a week away from midterm elections, 
elections that have been as strange and crazy as any, I think, in our history. War rages in Ukraine. The profound polarization in our political system leaves us ill-prepared to deal with long-term issues of gun violence, economic inequality, climate change, and racial justice. And deep distrust in our electoral processes is, is undermining our democratic system. And our political polarization makes regaining trust difficult. And we find ourselves in an odd space, denominationally. We are in an agonizingly protracted disaffiliation period that doesn't always bring out our best. And speaking of disaffiliation, the Pew Research Center recently released their report modeling the future of religion in America. The report projects that rates of religious disaffiliation, one form of what they call switching, switching meaning that whatever faith tradition or whatever religious perspective you were born into changes when you move into adulthood, Disaffiliation is one form of that. The report notes that if current rates of switching away from Christianity to continue, Christians will be less than 50% of the population of the United States by 2070. And the reality is the rate of switching from Christianity is not staying the same. It is accelerating and has been accelerating since the early 1990s. Grappling with that disaffiliation is easily as important as grappling with our denominational disaffiliation. And I'm floating in a most peculiar way, and the stars look very different today. Odd space. And we are moving into new space with its own challenges. The emerging United Methodist Church, and frankly, it's space that some are trying to describe in ways that I don't recognize, but the church has been here before, and I don't just mean the United Methodist Church. Issues of common life, of what kind of space the church is, of what this emerging Jesus community will be, those issues have been raised before. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Paul obviously did not grasp the benefits of a vegan diet. Some judge one day better than another, while others judge all days alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. To what range of issues did Paul refer when he invited followers of Jesus to allow for that kind of diversity? Not to demand uniformity, but to let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Other New Testament writings and epistles could illustrate some of those controversies and tensions of this emerging Jesus community as they dealt with the question of what kind of space they were creating. We could have read from Acts 15 about the council in Jerusalem. Should Gentile followers of Jesus be circumcised and follow the law of Moses in its entirety? Is that the kind of space we want to create? A decision is reached that we should not trouble those Gentiles who are turning to God with all of this. Frankly, I think not requiring circumcision was sound theologically and practically. Ironically, it's following the council's determination later in that same chapter that Paul and Barnabas have a dispute the disagreement, it says, becomes so sharp that they part ways. The church has been here before. We're moving into its own space with its new challenges, the emerging United Methodist Church. The road to that space will be bumpy at times, like a farm-to-market road or like a triple-digit county highway in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And we need to think together about what this new space will be. Under the grace of God and Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, what will this new space look like? I'm committed, committed to working with you in the Spirit to create space that is genuinely spacious and gracious. Let love be genuine. 
Love one another with mutual affection. Oh, no one anything but to love one another. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. The space that is the Jesus community is meant to be spacious and gracious, embracing diversity, marveling at the wonder of the variety of persons, all of whom reflect the very image of God. All persons, regardless of racial identity, ethnic background, sexual orientation, gender identity, life experience, perspective, education, socioeconomic class, all are persons to be respected and valued as reflecting the image of God. We should also be clear that the grace in this space includes the grace of discomfort. Being in spaces where there is difference is uncomfortable for everyone. Differences of racial, ethnic background, sexual orientation and gender identity, life experience, perspective, education, socioeconomic class. Difference is a little uncomfortable sometimes. A lot uncomfortable sometimes. But we don't learn and grow without some anxiety and some discomfort. In his insightful book about higher education, Safe Enough Spaces, Michael Roth, the president of Wesleyan University in Connecticut, writes this, if students confuse safety with feeling uncomfortable, they should be challenged in ways that undermine their comfort. One must meet them where they are, but one must not leave them in the same space one found them. Roth says he wants his classrooms to be safe enough spaces Places where students bring their whole selves to class and they're respected when they do. I think that's a nice image for the spaciousness and graciousness of the space we want to create in the church. There will be uncomfortable moments in our transformational journeys with Jesus, but transformation is what Jesus is about. Transforming us individually towards holiness transforming us communally toward beloved community. I'm committed to working with you in the spirit to create space that is genuinely spacious and gracious. I'm committed to working with you in the spirit to create space that is genuinely creative and curious. Many years ago, I read a book entitled The Ironic Christian's Companion. It was one of those books, never heard of the author, Never read a review of it, but the the title sang to me from the bookshelf in the bookstore. You might not want to go with me into a bookstore. (laughs) The author writes this, Once upon a time, the term Christian meant wider horizons, a larger heart, minds set free, room to move around. But these days, he was writing in 1999, Christian sounds pinched, squeezed, Mm. narrow, Many people who identify themselves as Christians seem to have leapfrogged over life, short-circuited the adventure. When Christian appears in a headline, the story will probably be about lines drawn, not about boundaries expanded. Curiosity, he says, imagination, exploration, adventure are not preliminary to the Christian identity, a kind of booster rocket to be jettisoned once orbit is achieved. They are part of the payload. Space for curiosity, imagination, exploration, adventure, a larger heart. A word I've come to love for this is the word capacious. Capacious heart and mind and soul. Capacious, it speaks of both roominess and increased capacity. A capacious heart and mind and soul. And mind. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in one of his sermons preached this, never must the church tire of reminding persons that they have a moral responsibility to be intelligent. (laughs) Must we not admit, King preached, that the church has often overlooked this moral demand for enlightenment. At times it is talked as though ignorance were a virtue and intelligence a crime. 
I am committed to working with you in the Spirit to create space that is genuinely creative and capacious, a space of curiosity and intelligence and adventure, a space that increases our capacities for kindness and thoughtfulness. I'm committed to working with you in the Spirit to create space that is genuinely rooted, rooted in Scripture, the constitutive witness to the wellsprings of our faith, rooted in Scripture as illumined by tradition, vivified in personal experience, and confirmed by reason. And I know you recognize those quotes from the Book of Discipline. But most of all, rooted in Jesus Christ, the living Word of God in our midst, whom we trust in life and in death. Much has been floating around about the theology of the future United Methodist Church, and I'm not here to offer a point-by-point rebuttal to it, but my own commitments and affirmations and an invitation to create space. The space we create moving forward into the future must be and will be rooted in our faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior It will be and must be rooted in the history of our Christian faith, rooted and grounded in Scripture, tradition, reason, and experience, with Scripture as the constitutive witness to our faith. When it is so rooted, it also allows, I think, for creativity and curiosity. The theological task, though related to the church's doctrinal expression, serves a different function. Our doctrinal affirmations assist us in the discernment of Christian truth in ever-changing contexts. Our theological task includes the testing, renewal, elaboration, and application of our doctrinal perspective in carrying out our call to spread scriptural holiness over these lands. Another quote from the Book of Discipline. As United Methodists, we are rooted in our doctrinal heritage and offered room to think creatively about that heritage. I like to think of the theological task of a bit like jazz. You begin with a tune, and that tune grounds everything the ensemble will be playing. If if you've ever listened to, to John Coltrane and what he does with my favorite things, there are times when you wonder if the tune will get lost, only it reemerges later. It does mean that sometimes creative theological thinking may strike some wrong notes but it doesn't mean the tune has changed. It only means maybe we've discovered some limits beyond which the tune is no longer the same tune. Yet we remain rooted in that tune. I'm committed to working with you in the spirit to create space that is genuinely rooted. I'm committed to working with you in the spirit to create space that is magnanimous. Years ago, I read a book uh, in Lewis Smed's book, A Pretty Good Person, Love that title, too. He said, what we often need is not to be forgiven, but to be indulged a little. Not every annoyance needs forgiveness. Some pains beg only for a little magnanimity. With a little magnanimity, the quality of the big soul that puts up with small pains, we can reserve serious forgiving for serious offenses. Now, magnanimous space sounds lovely, but it's incredibly complex. Who gets to define serious offenses? Too often it has been persons of relative privilege like me, and that doesn't work. And I have been in spaces where good-hearted, well-intentioned people are afraid to say much of anything for fear that they might be quickly shamed and shut down. And that doesn't work well either. Magnanimous space might be like the banquet Jesus describes in Luke 14, where we're sensitive to the space, offering others the better places and making sure to include those often included. Well, when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and maybe when you invite them, Well, we can find some better terms for the invitation. Magnanimous space might be like the community space Paul describes in Romans 12. Let love be genuine. 
Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor, do not lag in zeal, be ardent in the spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with one another, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly, do not claim to be wiser than you are, if it is possible so far as it depends on you. Live peaceably with all. If spacious space is one dimension of what we're trying to create, making room at the table for all, magnanimous space has something to do with our table manners. We want safe enough space where we recognize the hurtful and harmful potential of words, and we want space where good-hearted, well-intentioned people are not afraid to join the conversation. Space where magnanimity is present and forgiveness is possible. I'm committed to working with you in the spirit to create space that is magnanimous. I'm committed to working with you in the spirit to create space that is evangelical and disciple-making. Friends, as we continue to affirm in our work that we are inviting all, that all needs all, all means all, we need to ask, what it is we are inviting people to. As we continue to press forward to expand inclusion, we need to ask, what is it we're including people in? Rooted in our historic Christian faith, we know that we have good news to share in Jesus Christ. Good news that redemption is possible, forgiveness is possible, new life is possible, transformation is possible, beloved community is possible, justice is possible. Our space must be evangelical space and disciple-making space because this good news that we share lovingly and freely is intended to take roots in our souls and transform our lives. Because frankly, we're inviting people to an adventure with Jesus. And what we're including people in is the work of Jesus in the world. The work of peacemaking and reconciliation, of justice, of breaking down dividing walls, of beloved community, of healing, of beauty, of hope, of love. And you know what? All those other descriptors of the kind of space we want to create moving into the future say something about evangelical space. How many people have switched away from Christianity because they've not found our our space safe enough space? Or maybe challenging enough space? How many people have not given the church a chance because it's not seen as a space for creativity and curiosity and intelligence because it's not seen as capacious space? How many people have turned away because we have not seemed deeply rooted enough in our own story? And how many people have chosen to leave because our space has not been magnanimous? I'm committed to working with you in the Spirit to create space that is evangelical and disciple-making. In this odd space that we are creating, in this odd space, we are creating new space, which will also be odd space, countercultural space. In a world of cynicism, this will be a space of hope. In a world of erecting barriers, this will be a space of bridges and reconciliation. In the midst of a world satisfied with superficial thinking and tweets, this will be thoughtful space that grapples with complexity, that takes seriously the moral responsibility to be intelligent. And in the midst of a political culture that someone has described as confrontational and sensational and dismissive, this will be space that is thoughtful, magnanimous, playful, creative, and capacious. Just a couple more thoughts. And I wonder if sometimes we need additional metaphors to describe our journey in Jesus in creating this space. We often use the phrase, the seat at the table. It's a wonderfully important phrase. It is important. And often the vision I get is a table of a board of directors making decisions. And when we talk about a seat at the table, we recognize the importance of having more voices at the table, listening more carefully to the voices that have not been present before. 
It's an important metaphor, a vitally important metaphor. Yet as the church, there's another table to which we often refer as followers of Jesus. To everyone born, a place at the table. The table of Jesus Christ where bread is broken, wine shared freely, and good news proclaimed. And that to me is a different feel than a boardroom table. And I wonder if we might do well to focus on that table. And I wonder if focusing on that table, what we are up to in our journey with Jesus to create new space, is taking whatever old decision-making tables there are and chopping them up for firewood so that we can gather together in a very different kind of space where we listen more intently to our stories, where we share good news around a warming fire, where food is shared person to person, and there is singing, and there is laughter, and maybe some tears as well. Might that be deeply evangelical space? Or maybe the metaphor is a, of a multiplication of tables. So we, we have a joyous banquet where we're able to move from table to table, listening and conversing. And, and maybe in the middle of all those tables uh, at the banquet, there's a dance floor where we can move and mingle. Might that be deeply evangelical space? Now, I'm not asking us to jettison the decision-making table metaphor. Only wondering about expanding our palate for creative thinking and imagination as we think about the kind of space we are creating. So as I move to the conclusion of this address, I offer one more thought. It's one thing to acknowledge that not all want to share this space that this vision does not capture everyone's imagination or to some does not convey faithfulness, that some will not be part of the emerging United Methodist Church, that separation is happening and and may even be needed at this point in time. It's one thing to acknowledge that and another thing to say, don't let the door hit you on the way out. In his powerful book, The Persuaders, Anand Girdradas writes about a disturbing element of our culture, one where he says, one of, quote, writing people off, assuming they would never change their minds or ways, dismissing them as hopelessly mired in identities they couldn't escape, viewing those who thought differently as needing to be resisted rather than won over, refusing to engage in the work of persuasion. Later in his book, he writes, new research shows that if you want to change someone's mind, you need to have patience with them. Ask them to reflect on their life and listen. It's not about calling people out or labeling them. What will our space look like if we leave room for people to reconsider, change their minds, think in new ways, be persuaded by creative intelligence, moved by God's Spirit, and maybe find ourselves sometimes changed in those conversations too. We are in an odd time of separation, and how we navigate this separation will have an impact on our ability to create the kinds of new spaces we are seeking to create. It will have an impact on our ability to be genuinely evangelical. Friends, we are in an odd space And in this odd space, we are also creating new space. New space that is in itself odd space. In the grace of Jesus Christ and in the power of the Spirit, let us together create spacious space, safe enough space, gracious space that also knows the grace of discomfort in a world of the cutting tweet of cocooned communities, of drawing narrow circles. This will be odd space. As odd as a Jerusalem council making room for Gentiles in God's spaciousness towards this odd space, we press on. In the grace of Jesus Christ and in the power of the Spirit, let us create creative space, curious space, capacious space in a world where thoughtfulness is circumscribed by 160 characters or 30-second videos when only the right questions are allowed, where social space becomes narrower and narrower and social media space becomes more toxic and the moral obligation to be intelligent seems quaint. Uh. 
This will be odd space. As odd as manna in the wilderness, as odd as Elijah's overflowing jar of oil, as odd as wine turned, water turned into wine at a wedding banquet, flowing beyond measure toward this odd space, we press on. In the grace of Jesus Christ and in the power of the Spirit, let us together create rooted space where our lives are rooted in Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, where the creative jazz of our theological thinking soars while remaining rooted in Scripture as the constitutive witness of our faith, where we remain rooted in tradition, reason, and, and experience in a world where rootedness and creative expression are often pitted against one another and where so many feel rootless. This will be odd space, as odd, as odd as a God who takes an enslaved people and with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm brings them to a wide and broad land flowing with milk and honey toward this odd space. We press on. And in the grace of Jesus Christ and in the power of the Spirit, let us together create magnanimous space, room for all, yet a mannered room of courtesy and kindness where we recognize the power of words, the power to hurt and wound, the power to heal. We recognize the need for words, and frankly, we recognize the challenge we all feel at times to put what we want to say adequately into words. In a world where talk is cheap, where the cutting remark is valued if it's a laugh line. This will be odd space. As odd as a Jesus who ate with sinners and the disreputable toward this odd space, we press on. And in the grace of Jesus Christ and in the power of the Spirit, let us together create evangelical space and disciple-making space. We have good news, friends. We have good news to share. The grace of God still touches and transforms. The Spirit of God still builds beloved community. This is odd space. Odd space in a world where religion switching accelerates and Christ is often heard as bad news. It's odd. It's as odd as the member of a minority group in a backwater reaches of a vast empire executed for defying that empire, becoming the crucified and risen Lord. Toward this odd space, toward this odd space, we press on. Let love be genuine. Love one another with mutual affection. Oh, no one anything, anything but to love. Toward that space, we press on. And when you give a banquet, Invite those often neglected, ignored, left behind. Add more tables. Enlarge the dance floor. Toward that space, we press on. Toward this new space. Toward this new space, all my relatives, we press on. In the grace of Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we press on because Christ Jesus has made us his own. Commencing countdown engines on. Check ignition and may God's love be with you. Indeed. Bishop Bard, thank you. I 
and to all of you odd people. I want you to turn to your neighbor. I don't do this much, it's not my thing, but I like it every now and again. Just turn to one neighbor and say, I'm odd and I'm glad about it. Oh, I'm glad about it. I am definitely odd, odd and, and I'm more than glad about it. Yeah, wow. Wow, 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 wow. I bet you'll stop playing the Episcopal Address cheap. And... <laughs> <laughs>